Well, we record Right Angles usually on the morning of Tuesday, and the first debate will be on the night of Tuesday. And as Ron White would say, that puts me in quite a pickle. Uh, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to assume, as I always do, that the debates are the beginning of the home stretch for any presidential election. Everything up to the debates is basically going around the lap. But once you get to the debates, you are definitely in the home stretch. So what I thought we would do is take a quick look back at election year uh, 2020. And I will ask my good friends, Steve Green and Scott, out what they think about this. And I'm going to ask them two questions. Don't be alarmed. This is not a lightning round. I'm not capable of producing that. I have not the training that Steve has. <laughs> but nevertheless, we are going to ask you, uh, you guys two questions and, um, and, and get your take on, on this, this goat rodeo that we saw. Uh, so first of all, uh, Steve and Scott, same question for you. Steve, we'll start with you, I guess. Uh, Donald Trump. Um, spent the election year fighting off impeachment, COVID-19, all the rest of that stuff, but he, but his, his uh, position was never in any danger. How do you think the election year turned out for uh, Trump and for, uh, for the legion of Democrats that winnowed itself down to two of the most unelectable people <laughs> in the history of the world, according to their own primaries? There, it, it is so frightening that a scheming mediocrity like Joe Biden could be this close to the Oval Office. Um, I mean, he, he, he's an Ayn Rand villain, uh, a person of, uh, <laughs> of no particular talent or personality who has yeah, nonetheless managed to uh, scheme his way into great riches and possibly great power. Uh, it's just, it really speaks to... Uh, what a cesspit, what a swamp Washington, D.C. has become. The whole family, it's its Biden Incorporated. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of China. Well, uh, Ukraine has a major interest in there as well. Uh, and for this guy to have a non-zero chance to be the next president of the United States is absolutely frightening. I mean, even if you believe, as I don't, that he still has all, all of his faculties, it just, it just speaks to how deep and thick and putrid the swamp is. Uh, it, 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 it frightens me, frankly. And Harris, what, what do you say about a woman who slept her way into politics and then put a lot of black men behind bars for bad reasons and then kept them there past uh, when their sentences were due? I, this is the best the Democrats have to offer this year. And God help us if they win. Uh, Scotty, uh, as, as I recall, it's been a while since this whole goat rodeo started. But if I remember correctly, there were more than just Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris on that stage in the first debate. Uh, there may have been one or two others. Um, what happened to the herd that was culled and how did these two survive that uh, adventure? Because there were lots and lots and lots of choices if you were a Democrat this year. And this is what they ended up with. Well, there was a myth. There was a theory that uh, that Joe Biden was electable um, based on, I suppose, uh, the many uh, several times that he's all already proven that he's unelectable to this office. Um, he was, you know, handpicked to be vice president. It wasn't really a matter of electing him to that office. And he had run for president several times before and had lost. The only thing he was really electable to was the Senate in a state that's so small that every voter calls the other voters by name. And this is just somehow there, there was this legend that this guy was electable, perhaps because he was bathing in the Northern Lights cast from the crown of Barack Obama. And maybe they just thought, well, some of that's going to rub off, certainly. Um, and, and by the way, it wasn't these two, because uh, Kamala Harris was actually just hand-selected like Joe Biden was by Barack Obama. So Kamala Harris was one of the washouts along with, you know, Beto mm -hmm. O'Rourke. Um, it, when it got down to the end of it, I can't imagine that there weren't some Democrats who were going, we could have had Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> Yeah. We could have, we could have had somebody here. Um, this, all that said, uh, I think your home stretch uh, theory here is so good that I think that the entire presidential campaign should be concentrated into a six week period before election oh, you day, said it, brother. and that we should not start two years in advance of that. Um, 
And I will tell you, because I keep an eye on the, the mainstream media, uh, today on CNN, as I was uh, you know, listening out of the corner of my ear, um, they were speculating that it's possible that President Trump might still be able to pull this one out and win. Um, yeah. They are absolutely convinced from their polling that Joe Biden is leading everywhere Joe Biden needs to lead. And they actually had an electoral college vote count up on the screen that showed that Joe Biden was at 269 and President Trump was at 160 something. What does he need? 270 to win. Um, so that if you watch the mainstream media, you think that this one's all over but the crying. Um, so <laughs> we'll see. Well, I agree with that. The only thing I, I have to uh, that I'm excited about is that there are just a couple of weeks left in this goat rodeo, and I can't wait for it to be over. Me neither. Yeah. By the way, when you mentioned Better O'Rourke, I got that kind of warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feeling that you would get if you heard the Gilligan's Island theme while you were in Paris or something like that. <laughs> um, I, I had the best so line Steve, on Better O'Rourke. Looks Steve, like second Bobby question drives for like you. Ted. <laughs> the uh, the new story of the year apparently has something to do with this uh, COVID-19 virus that I've been reading about lately. Hmm. So uh, my second question for both of you guys is, do you think that the COVID-19 outbreak hurt or helped President Trump? And also, did it hurt or help uh, Joe Biden? Is that to me first? Yep. Yeah, I, I think it hurt everybody. Uh, Trump was really cruising along until this thing happened. And I... You look at the states where the lockdown is the most severe and it's Democratic governors trying to kill the national economy, I believe, in order to torpedo Trump in November. Uh, also, I think they've, they've got a power fetish. Otherwise, they wouldn't mm -hmm. be progressive Democratic governors. Um, I forgot to answer your home stretch question. I got so into Biden's corruption and ineptitude that I forgot to do that. I love the home stretch. Um, I've been feeling really confident lately, but I've also had to spend more time on Twitter uh, because of because of work. I don't engage on Twitter anymore, but I have to read the damn thing. And the more time I spend on Twitter, the less confident I feel because it's such a political echo chamber. The more time I spend out in the real world talking to real people, the more confident I feel. The fact that these are two different worlds and Twitter is a self-reinforcing cesspit uh, just with more people in it than Washington, D.C., but otherwise exactly the same. I have to remember that. I have to keep that in mind. Otherwise, I don't think, <laughs> look at my dark circles. Otherwise, I don't think I'm going to sleep between now and November 4th. And the way things look, we're not even going to know for a couple of weeks because they're screwing this stuff up with the mail-in ballots. So um, this is the home stretch. Don't lose your cool, everybody. Get out there and vote. And if it's mail-in, I don't know, go around and grab some uh, ballots that you find on the floor somewhere and mail those into. I'm kidding about that. Don't break any laws. So, Scott, how do you feel uh, the COVID outbreak helped um, Team Red and Team Blue? Um, helped to hurt them? Frankly, I think all of this has just illustrated why uh, disease prevention and health shouldn't have anything to do with politics. Um, it shouldn't be a political issue. I don't, when you talk about a disease and the toll of that on individual people, the name of a politician should never even come up in that conversation. It should all be about science and medicine and, you know, preventive measures and things like that, not having anything to do with anybody running for office or how this improves or affects their chances. Uh, it just shows you kind of what's wrong with the, the Democratic emphasis on putting everything in the hands of government. And if I have to watch one more news story where some governor of some state is lamenting the fact that President Trump hasn't gotten serious about a disease and no reporter ever follows up and says, hey, governor, uh, what is your role among your people there within the borders of your state? I'm curious. <laughs> Why is it that you have to keep saying what President Trump did? Is it possibly because you're not doing anything or there's nothing that can really be done from your perspective or from the perspective of an executive in a governmental function? It's really about people. It's about healthcare. It's about hospitals. It's about doctors. It's about medicines. It's about, you know, preventive measures that individuals and businesses decide to take to protect themselves and not having anything to do with it. I, I think if we learned anything from this go round, it is the next time we deal with some major health crisis, we ought to uh, immediately uh, e eject any politician who says anything about it. <laughs> 
Well, uh, here's my two cents. Um, I think that the I think that the single salient event of the of the election year was the moment that the Democrats realized that Bernie Sanders was going to win the nomination. That's when everything yeah. really changed. Yeah. When it became obvious to them that, that, that this ancient, nasty, uh, cranky old communist was going to become the Democratic nominee, the Democratic Party did everything they could to pull the levers and get the endorsements and so on. And all of a sudden, Joe Biden was uh, shoved to the front of the line because he was the only person that was sort of, a, you know, an antacid in a way for what Bernie was uh sending out there in terms of his vibes. He was he was selected. And and the fact that they chose Biden is an indication of just how badly they feared uh, Bernie Sanders and, and how badly they screwed over Bernie Sanders voters for a second time in a row now. Yeah. So I think to me that was the the major deal on the on the Democratic side. And I think everything after that explains itself. Nobody on that stage of the 27 nominees that they had in the beginning or whatever the number was all of them were rejected, including Joe Biden. And it's only the fact that Bernie Sanders did as well as he did that, that I think Joe Biden ended up getting selected. Trump, of course, had to deal with impeachment during most of this time, Russia probe, Ukraine probe, all of that. All of those turned out to be zero. I don't think that much changes things. His supporters always knew he didn't do it. His, his detractors always know that he did, and they still believe that he did, in spite of the fact there's no evidence that he did. As far as the uh, COVID thing goes, I was really referring more to the lockdown, but but I think I think that the, that it certainly hurt Donald Trump because the economy was humming along, everybody was making money, everybody was doing well, and yeah. and I don't see anybody uh, any way that anybody could have beaten him if if that hadn't um, happened. Uh, without question, in my opinion, the the COVID lockdown was. What, the COVID lockdown was the only reason that Biden was allowed to become the nominee. If there had not been a COVID lockdown and a good excuse to keep Biden under the lid, we talked about this last week, if there was no good excuse to keep Biden locked down, he could not have been the nominee. It's only because of COVID-19 that he was able to make pre-recorded canned speeches from his basement, and even those were horrible. It also occurs to me that it's just barely possible that COVID will end up being um, a, a possible uh, benefit to Donald Trump only because I think people have just reacted so harshly in the Democratic states that remain locked down. Here in California, people are cursing Gavin Newsom to the, to the rafters, which is unheard of. Many of them still blame Trump, but we don't know. We'll see. Um, it's been an ugly, ugly, awful year. And I hope I never see the like of it again. Um, and I won't. Uh, the only thing that keeps me up is the fact that 2021 could be worse. <sighs> or it could be better. That's how things go in the future, you know. We'll be here with you one way or another, uh, holding your hands and, uh, and, and, in, and in good liberal fashion, telling you exactly what to think about things. For Steve Green and Scott <laughs> out, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the members for making this show possible. 